Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this is Lady Ballers. Uh, welcome. You're going to hear a conversation between some of the most prominent female bosses currently in the podcasting game. Um, we're going to discuss what makes a great podcast, what it's like to manage creative talent, um, and how all of these women just basically got where they are now. So um, before we really get started, I should introduce myself. I'm Brittany Luce. Um, I am in my day job, the host of a podcast called Sampler at Gimlet Media. And on the side, I host, co-host for Colored Nerds with my best friend from Howard, Eric Eddings. Um, so yeah, I got into podcasting happenstance. Like I attended Work It last year, like got in on, like I didn't even have an actual name tag, like I got in on a hope and a prayer. And now, <laughs> um, yeah, and now like I podcast full time and I'm like here on stage talking to you guys. So like, just, that's great, I love that, this is a, what a great crowd, like you guys are so hype. Um, so I am just as excited as you guys are to hear from these women, um, but before we introduce them, um, one of the things that I really also wanted to talk about today is sort of like how I transitioned to podcasting from corporate America and I noticed, and this is something that they talked about and did like very little about, that women mostly got stuck in like the marzipan layer of middle management. Um, I had to Google marzipan layer because I don't eat cakes like this, but the marzipan layer is what's between the frosting and the actual cake. And I guess if the cake and the frosting touch, it's bad. I don't know. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Great British Bake Off, but they care about stuff like that. <laughs> but that's where a lot of women get stuck professionally. Um, it's just really hard to kind of break through, but these are three women who definitely, definitely, definitely did. Um, so let's get into it. So our first panelist right here to my left is Julie Shapiro. She co-founded the Third Coast Festival back in 2000, um, which gathers producers from all over the world to talk shop and share wisdom about the art and craft of documentary radio production. Uh, she, served as artistic direct, she served as artistic director there until 2013. So you started it, and then you were there for over a decade. Yes. So I'd say your thumbprint I'm is just over like there. That. What's that? What's just, just like, like that? that. Yeah. Um, and she is now the executive producer of Radiotopia from PRX, <laughs> which is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, so our next lady baller <laughs> is Miss Jen Weiss Berman. Uh, she actually started her career at a corporate law firm, but after I don't know why you had to put that. In What's that? It's <laughs> interesting. It's okay. interesting. I could list all. I could list like literally the 20 jobs that I had before I worked at Gimlet. It'll cool. make you feel way, way, way better. I used to work at a motorcycle dealership. You guys, I got fired from there three years ago. <laughs> like you know, um, but you started at a corporate law firm, but after an internship at StoryCorps, uh, Jenna plunged full throttle into audio has not turned back since. Um, so she's since worked at StoryCorps as a mobile facilitator and manager. Uh, she was a producer at The Moth, NPR, and right here at WNYC, all of which prepared her to eventually become the director of audio at BuzzFeed, uh, where she launched another round, maybe you've heard of it, uh, Women of the Hour with Lena Dunham, and many more shows. So most recently, Jenna opened up her own shop with Long Forms Max Linsky called Pineapple Street Media. And they have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. So warm welcome for Jenna. <laughs> and then um, to my far left, I think some of you guys might know this woman. This is Paula Schumann. <laughs> uh, from right here, exactly. You might work upstairs, possibly. Uh, Paula got her start in journalism, uh, actually in print. She worked as a reporter, writer, and editor um, for you know such places as like the Daily Beast, Wall Street Journal. Um, and she is the co-author of the book Spouseonomics. Currently, Paula is the oh, vice president of on-demand content at WNYC <laughs> and WNYC Studios, where she spearheaded uh, WNYC's accelerator program last year that received over 400 pitches. Um, and also, thanks to Paula, we are all here at Work It. Yeah. So, like, yeah. woo, welcome everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. <laughs> so, um, let's get started. Is everybody ready? Yes. Why not? Feeling loose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. These are full of vodka. A little uh, so, <laughs> I would. Sorry. <laughs> no. we're uh, so, we're Julie, um, in March you launched PodQuest, which was like an open competition to find Radiotopia's next podcast. And after receiving 1,500, like 1,500, like over 1,000 <laughs> entries, <laughs> you guys recently announced the top 10 semifinalists. Like, what were you looking for? in pitches that helped you narrow it down from 1,500 
to 10. 10. Well, <laughs> it, it was such a massive project. The volume of entries way beyond what we were expecting. So the big question was, what were the pitches that would resonate with us as Radiotopia shows? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people say, well, how many were good? And I was like, well, they were good in lots of different ways, but what were the ones that really were right for Radiotopia? So we were looking for a real um, a priori prioritizing of format and creativity and approach to storytelling. Uh, we were looking for really interesting people who may not have all the training in the world, but showed great potential, originality. You know, a lot of shows compared themselves to other shows in the pitch. Not always the, the greatest idea. Um, there was just a, a real matrix of considerations we were making. Sometimes it was just a secret sauce kind of chemistry between the written word and the two minute audio clip they gave. Mm -hmm. um, so there were all these considerations. I mean, it was really hard to pin, da pin it down as a science. But you know, and then there was the, there's the gut feeling about certain pitches that really jumped out. Uh, I want to open this question up to everybody um, because all of you guys like green light it, yeah. like have green lighted and will continue to green light shows. Um, like what makes a great pitch? Like what catches your eye? Even like Paula, you had the accelerator program here. I mean, 400 is not easy <laughs> to yeah, go we through. Of, we had to work with Excel in a really complicated way. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you go with your gut and also I feel like as often as I go with my gut, I also try to get a lot of gut checks. Um, mm. I, I trust my instinct, but I also I, I'm just someone who asks for uh, help a lot and asks for other people to weigh in. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, I think uh, so much of, of you know, what makes a good idea is the person behind that idea mm -hmm. um, and whether they, they can articulate the idea and the way they're going to go about doing it. And, you know, like I said, I was a print journalist for many years and, mm -hmm. um, and, and an editor and... You know, you, you kind of know it when you see it, but you also, you see what that person has done before. Um, you see what that person brings to the table that other people don't. Um, there's a million and one considerations, but I definitely think it starts with, like, are you, are you bowled over, first and foremost? What about you, Jenna? I like to look for things that are totally new in the space. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, like, when we started another round, it was really exciting to me that we could make probably like the first really well-produced show with two black women hosts. Um, there were other shows out there, but like not much editing on them, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be like the second or third place that's doing something in like a form. I want I would like to be like the, the first. <laughs> and so I get really, <laughs> I'm, that's no shit talk to anybody who has done the second or third. Um, <laughs> I love you guys. Um, but yeah, or the fourth, but, uh, yeah, I think it's, I'd like, there's so much that can be done in this space. It's amazing. And I, I really want to like try all these new things. It's, it's crazy that there isn't like a massive show for children, for example, like that would be mm. a, a huge sure success. Works, right? Yeah. I mean, I've, <laughs> I think a few people are racing to it at the moment. Uh, but yeah, I, I like, I get really excited by like totally new, like kind of kooky ideas. Can I, just oh, to yeah. follow up too, we also needed viable ideas that could be sustainable shows and weren't just great ideas. Mm -hmm. So there's the business side of it. And um, I talk a lot, I think a lot about the business side of things now alongside the creative input. And I agree, it's like really about a, p a person. We also wanted to diversify Radiotopia. We wanted to have voices not represented yet already in the network. So those were also for us two very driving considerations. Uh, so all three of you like have also green-lighted shows that are like insanely successful. Um, and Jenna, I'm actually really glad that you brought up like another round. Another round kind of merges this thing that Julie's talking about, like something that's really like commercially viable because at the end of the day you have a business, but it's also just like really, really good content. It seems like you focused on that part first and foremost. Like what do you think is the foundation of a great podcast? Me? Yeah. Oh, God. I mean everybody, <laughs> but I was making direct eye contact with you. <laughs> um, I mean... I think like what makes another round so great is that it's like Heaven and Tracy are amazing <laughs> and they're hilarious. It's also really well edited by this lady right here, Eleanor Kagan. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I think that you like there needs to be a personality that you want to keep coming back to for sure. Um, and pretty much every successful podcast I can think of has that. Uh, 
that's I think that's the main thing. It's like I mean I know that there I I haven't worked too much on like hugely produced shows like mm-hmm. um, This American Life, which are very like story driven and they find amazing like perfect stories every time basically. <laughs> so for shows that I'm working on, because we're always going to have a smaller team, um, yeah, I think you have to find a great personality that people want to check back with. Julie, you um, recently brought Millennial Podcast by Megan Tan, who's in the room. Uh, you recently brought <laughs> Megan and yeah. Millennial to Radiotopia. Like, how did you know that Millennial and Radiotopia would be a good fit? It was just so obvious. No, um, <laughs> no, it's a great question because I think coming into my position, that was a, a lot of pressure. Like, what is going to be the next move Radiotopia makes, mm-hmm. and you know, what, how much input could I have to that decision? And so I had been listening to Millennial all along, um, and I was just hearing the. Sh- I loved the. I started really loving the show, and it, it grew on me as Megan kind of expanded her approach to telling her story and then other people's stories. And I was thinking, I heard her talk about it in an interview, and I. I just was very impressed by the depth at which she was thinking about the whole process. Um, <laughs> oh, well timed. Um, wow. And yeah. <laughs> Fact checkings, anyone? Um, so, but the thing was, it, it was really in the conversations we started having where we were thinking of, you know, all these things that I wanted out of my next collaborator and the, um, the statement I wanted us to make with the next Radiotopia show coming on board. Um, Megan was so driven. She was clearly going to work really hard. She was thinking way beyond just the audio, but putting primarily all of her crea- creative energy into the audio, but also knowing wh- what it would, you know, bringing video into her launch and understanding all the different ways that we could talk about the show and different platforms for promoting the show. So it was just like this mix of the right energy and a willingness to collaborate. And um, But at the, at the beginning was the content, and then everything else kind of spiraled out from there. And then we met, and we just got along great. And I thought, like, it, it's really important. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's like, because I'm a woman, I'm favoring a relationship that grows out of a connection for a working environment. But I felt like that was a really, there was trust there. Um, you know, trust that she's going to come on board and work really hard, work as hard as all the other radio producers who were also working for. And it just, it just felt like a lot of things fell into place with, with bringing her on board. I like what you say about, um, about like, you know, bringing it back to like a relationship and the way that you felt when, you know, listening to her show, but also the way that you felt when you met Megan. It reminds me of something that you just said, Paula, about like you go with a person. Like if you're trying to make a show work, you go with a person. Like you also said, though, that you go with your gut, go with the person, but you also need gut checks. Yeah. <laughs> like when when do you get like mm. when are you like, I need a gut check? Like what's something that makes you be like, mm, I need to get somebody else's opinion on this? Um. I would say uh, when um, when I like the person, but I'm not sure about the idea, mm-hmm. or when um, when I want something to work a lot mm-hmm. and it's like not quite there, and I kind of need someone to tell me that it's okay <laughs> to not do it, you know? Yeah. Um, I think I don't know. I think people face that a lot, where it's just like it's so close, but it's just like. It's it's not quite there, and 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 I'm just going to be really bummed if I can't work with this person. But I I don't know if I can. I mean, I would also add just to the the question of like things that that sort of pop is that, especially you know there are a lot of conversation podcasts out there now. Like we're going to have conversation about this, we're going to have conversation mm-hmm. about that. Where I do think so much depends on the person, and then there are you know the other kind of shows that you know go deep on a certain issue. And one of the things that I think is often a red flag for me is when it's like the sort of you know, w- wouldn't it be interesting if kind of pitch, you know, kind of story where it's like, mm. yeah, anything could be interesting. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's the specificity of the idea and the story that you're going to go into that mm-hmm. I think shows the critical thinking behind uh, behind the idea. Um, so anyway, that's just something that I that I see a lot. But well, like, yeah, it's a little so, bit of a red flag. It seems like when you have like um, like a person who's like, you know, whatever, lightning in a bottle personality, like when you hear it, you're just like, oh, like I would love to like enter into some sort of audio companionship well, with this person. If they also have like a solid idea, it kind of sh- demonstrates like an understanding of their own appeal. Right. I mean, I mean, a great example is, you know, um, Kathy too and Tobin Lowe, incredible radio producers who 
were one of the winners of the podcast accelerators. Mm -hmm. Accelerator, they pitched a show called Gaydio. Um, and, you know, a sh because everyone's a little bit gay was their tagline. <laughs> um, and, you know, they just blew us out of the water. And that's just a rare situation where you have two people who, you know, like you were saying, Julie, clearly are so, are, uh, you know, are such great thinkers and so dedicated. And they're going to make this happen whether mm -hmm. I'm involved or not. And so mm -hmm. I want to be involved because yeah. mm -hmm. I don't want them to do it with anyone else. And it's a form, you know, it's a subject that, you know, it's like you said, I want to be the first person to do it. I don't, you know, and so it's the great combination of what they're going to be talking about and who they are. Um, and that was kind of a magic moment where I felt like, you know, no gut check needed. But of course, there were plenty of people who were like, yes, <laughs> Tobin and Kathy. <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm actually glad you guys just stay away. like brought up viability <laughs> of certain ideas because at the end of the day, each of you work for organizations that have to make money. Um, like, can you, t can you tell me about a time when you've had to compromise something that you really wanted to do? Or maybe you, there was a certain way that you wanted to go about it and you couldn't um, because that, you, know, you have a bottom line. Uh, well, I, I, it ha I'm pretty new to Radiotopia, so I haven't been making too many financial decisions or mm -hmm. decisions that would affect us financially. But tying in something that um, you were saying, Paula, Early on, maybe at the end of last year, we got a, a pitch just through the hard to find link on the website that you know if you have an idea, you can pitch it. Mm -hmm. um, people find it. <laughs> a lot of people find it. Um, I loved this idea. I'm not going to go into any specifics, but I really fell in love with it. I got in touch with the producers. I had some conversations with them. I heard a few episodes. It was like very creative and f fiction and like nothing I'd ever heard before. And it, it tied in some musical entities that I was familiar with. So I had some, I had a lot of faith in it, but um, not everyone else was as excited about this. But people were willing to trust me. They're like, well, you, you tend to back the really creative things. But when, when the question came to like, do you think we can find sponsors for this and will it grow an audience that will, you know, will they continue to grow? And I felt, I felt my heart sink because my brain knew I had to back away from it. So it wasn't like an actual decision not to go with them because I never offered something and took it back. But mm -hmm. it, it was like a sort of understanding that this was a new, I'm in a new, I actually have a, a different kind of position in relationship to this work and these opportunities. And that was definitely a good kind of, that will be a reference point for me going forward in making decisions. Is that like, you know, you guys didn't all start off being Lady ballers, but born, you uh, born, born, born a bread, born, yeah. born, born a baller, baller yeah. born a baller. <laughs> yeah, that's a child name for you, right? There. Um, but you know, that moment that you described, Julie, where you're sort of like, Oh, I'm in a different position now, like, I have to be held accountable in different ways. Like, you know, Paula, Jenna, do you have stories like that where you were kind of like, you know before I was making something and it was art and it was beautiful and this is great and now I have more responsibility and now people are like hey what about that budget <laughs> like do you have a moment like that I mean it's really scary to start a business and be entirely responsible for making the money um I think that what I like to the way I like to think about things is that if you do enough things that are making you money mm -hmm. um like right now we're going to we're working on a podcast for a very large cosmetics company. It's not necessarily like my dream show, but what that will allow us to do is fund shows that we're not sure will succeed. And I think taking risks in this business is incredibly important and very often pays off. When we started another round, we had people I t had so many people say like isn't it just like white guys who listen to podcasts? Like who's going to listen to this? What makes you think anyone's going to listen to this show? Um, and it turns out there was like a massive audience for that show. And so I think if, yeah, if you're balancing things where you're, you're thinking about like doing some very like low risk, high paying, not super interesting stuff, <laughs> and then balancing that with stuff that you're super excited about, um, then yeah, that's what I want to do. And I'm, I'm excited to say that at Pineapple Street, we're currently working on 10, like about 10 shows, and not one of them is hosted by a straight white man. <laughs> nice. Nice. Nothing wrong with straight white men. It's just, I, we, there's like, there are a lot of audiences that haven't been 
hit up enough, I think, with podcasts who, like, there's just so much, so many untapped audiences that want content, and I'm psyched to be working on that. I mean, I would say, you know, I work at a nonprofit, which is, you know, so we also, we, I think we have the luxury of being mission driven mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there's a real, like, we really believe in making things that are important, even if they're not necessarily going to, you know, make us millions. But when then we have to make the things that are going to be big brands so that we yeah. can support that. And I think that's just like any business. And so there's a lot of things that I don't think will, well, actually, I do think they will make a million dollars, but um, <laughs> I have to. I just have to convince people. But so before I can convince them, it has to be the kind of thing that you know they're taking a risk on. As long as we're, you know, getting the big numbers with other things, so it's balanced out. I mean, there are people in this room that I would like to make a podcast with tomorrow, but um, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta keep it all balanced. So, have you guys ever had a moment where you were just like, "Fuck it," like I don't care about this money. <laughs> like I just want to make the thing that I want to make. No. <laughs> And I don't, I don't think that's a great mindset, honestly. <laughs> it's just, I guess for me, what strikes me now is that I talk to people as much about the business side, and it's so important to understand why every, why you have to have that under, understanding when you come into this. It's just not about the ideas anymore. It's as much, well, it's as much about. I, I'd like to say that it's equal parts, but it's just, it's not a full picture of. It's not a full understanding of what you want to do if you don't get all of the women that talk to her in the stations of the pod. Like mm -hmm. those are like the tenets of like, yes, this is the other pieces of that pie, you know, and it's so, it's just so important. You just have to consider it all. With that in mind, how do you manage creative people though? Because like, you know, at the end of the day, you want to create, you want to have this. <laughs> Not easy. I feel like I, I touched all it, of I struck a nerve. Yeah. But I feel no, like you, no, no. Um, like you want to create a healthy yeah. and like safe creative environment where people feel comfortable taking the necessary risks that they do to create you know, not just like ambitious, but also successful programming. Uh, but you still have to keep everybody kind of like, you know, on, on point and well informed of like deadlines and benchmarks. Like how do you, like how do you operate at all those different levels when managing a team? I have it a little easier because like, we have no creative control over any of our shows. We just trust them to um, turn out brilliant podcasts. Um, no, it's it, but it's challenging too because everyone is open to input, but there would be no way to actually, you know, editorialize on every episode of every podcast. So, but Radiotopia's model is to just be more of a platform to help ramp up in the sustainability. So we help them do their best work, grow the audience, grow the revenue. So it's really up to them, and we are trying. We try to work with people that are driven and you know want the success enough to, to stay on on schedule and, and do it themselves so I maybe have a little little less challenge in that respect so you like you it seems like you probably manage people mostly over the phone and through email yeah I mean we're scattered all over the place so it's most I mean we're trying to bring people together as often as possible trying our first video conference call at the end of the month <laughs> with everyone <laughs> should be fun um, but yeah, it's a lot of it's just a lot of communicating. It's a lot of being. I think my biggest role is to be available for when the questions come up because there's so many questions that come up all the time between all of them. So put out this fire, another one spark. You know, it, it's it's a little like it is hurting. It is like hurting the creative cats around and stuff. It's it's definitely. I mean, it's you know, managing people is hard, and managing creative people is is really hard and also really amazing. And um, yeah, I have a probably a very different sort of day to day. I mean. I work, I have a team that's almost like a little startup within WNYC mm -hmm. and we, um, there's there's a bunch of people who are working on a bunch of different projects at once and um, and everybody's, you know, in fact, I just said to someone yesterday, I was like, why do you, like, she was like, I'll do it, I'll do it, you know, and I'm like, what, maybe you shouldn't do it, actually, like, why, why do you want to work so hard, like, to, like, it was like, the, and I was like, I can't believe I just asked that question of someone who works for me, it's a terrible thing, go back in time, start again, um, but I just have, like, this incredibly driven team who want to, like, do everything all the time, but also want to have creative control and, um, and so I often find that I'm just like, I'll have a situation where I've gotten all these cooks together because I'm like, oh, this person would be good with this and this person would be good. Let's all get in a room and, you know, and then I'll be like, wait, now there's too many cooks now. Like <laughs> now I've got to like just decide and then, you know, people are going to be kind of bummed that I, it, I, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I'm just like looking at people around the room or on my team thinking like, I, I don't want to, you know. They could probably answer better than I could. It's, it's really hard and it's very cool and it's hard and cool. <laughs> Jenna? <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I'm, I, I think that if you're a creative person who doesn't know how to make your ideas happen, I'm not that interested in working with you. Um, and don't like quote me on this on Twitter or anything, but I've often felt that way working with men where it's like you have a big idea and now you want it, you want these like 10 women to make your idea happen. (laughs) Struck a nerve there. (laughs) Um, it sounds like you guys can relate. Uh, and yeah, I just don't, I'm not impressed by creativity without follow through. So, um, and there's a lot of that in the world. So if you can, if you can do both, come and work with me. It's nice that idea though, that someone else, like you could just keep having ideas, I know. someone else yeah. can do them. Yeah, it like, must be great to get I a bunch of people that. to do yeah. your ideas. Um, can I go back to something you were saying about money? Yeah. Because <laughs> I like, I love to talk about I that. love talking about money. Yeah. I, you know this. <laughs> I talk about it a lot. Uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, like, I get the idea behind trying to do something that's not going to make money, but I think that you, if you're going to do that, you have to be making money elsewhere. And something that I want to say to everyone here is, like, if you can edit audio right now, you have an extremely valuable skill set that is really needed. Like, podcasts are blowing up right now. Uh, that's, like, why I started this company, because every fucking person in the world wants to have a podcast right now. And some people have really great ideas and some people are, it's like a lot of really interesting like publications and institutions want them right now and don't know how to make them. Um, And a fun thing about starting a company was that I got to kind of like take some of the values that I have about money and money making. And I'm going to try to like make them part of my business model. So like, we will pay all interns always, like a good, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy not to. Um, we live in New York City. Uh, and we're gonna like pay them all like a decent hourly wage. Um, we will never pay any producers under sixty thousand uh, dollars. Like that's new producers, and I don't really think it's acceptable to be doing that in this city. I don't know who does that. I'm. I don't know, like, how many... I'm, I'm trying to... How <laughs> is that? I don't know. No, but it's, like, we... You know, like, the average rent in Brooklyn is $3,000. Like, it's not what it was even, like, if you haven't changed what you're paying people drastically in the past 10 years, like, you need to read a newspaper or something. Um, so I'm excited that we can do that. I mean, like, we can't... I mean, I'm, like, currently paying people out of my savings account, but, like, that will change soon. <laughs> Um, detail. Yes, <laughs> when we we are bringing in money in the next few months, so we'll be okay. But um, but yeah, you guys have like a really a, like a skill set that not a lot of people have, and uh, like yeah, and so I I don't think that anyone should ever undervalue themselves, and you sh- you deserve to be paid well for what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. I guess speaking more about money, um, in a way, something that a lot of a, something that a lot of women have have problems with. Sorry, what's it? What Sorry? happened? I don't know. I, heard so, I was like, what? oh, is there someone talking? Um, something a lot of women have problems doing is asking for things that they need. Part of becoming a boss, I think, is getting used to asking for things. Like even Paula, you said whether it's help, like you love asking for help, um, asking for a raise, asking for uh, the right hourly rate, like to be able to like, there's a lot of freelancers I feel like in the room. Um, like even if you have a full time job, I feel like a lot of audio women are also like have side hustles. I know that I do, um, and I'm sure you get lots of people emailing you, asking you for help with things that they should really be paying you for, and they don't. Um, there was actually even I don't know how many people are here in Ladio. There was a really good thread in Ladio, like which is like a Google like Gmail group where like somebody was asking about like you know how to how to get paid what they're supposed to get paid for work like that like how do you guys I guess like how do you ask for things how do you ask for things and how do you know (laughs) really yeah I, I don't feel like I'm very good at that and I'm always learning from the people who work for me who do ask for things where I'm like I gotta learn from that like that was pretty impressive um I I mean obviously like I I've navigated my career I'm not you know but but um I, I, I feel like it's very, for me personally, it's very hard to ask for things. Uh, the woman who hired me at the Wall Street Journal, Joanne Littman, who's, you know, an incredibly 
you know, successful woman journalist, and she she wrote this op-ed for the Times a few years ago. I don't know if anybody saw it about how her in, in her entire career as a manager at the Wall Street Journal, no woman ever walked in and asked for a raise, um, but men yeah. routinely did. Yeah. And I was like, why? Well, I know all these things, and I have a hard time putting them into practice. So, um, but I would say that I, you know, for what it's worth, I've I have seen a lot of the younger women who work for me. Um, you know, be really good about asking for things. And so, I don't know, I take that as a positive sign. Have you, have you ever had a moment like where you asked for something, like you were terrified to ask for something and you did it anyway? And did ask. when? Yes, yeah, did ask. Like freaked out about it, probably like ruined all of your personal relationships worrying about whether or not you should ask for this thing. And then like asked. No. Or is that just me? Tell us more. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> um, that's such a that's such yeah. a weird. Oh, um, I don't know. Like, I, I really don't know about that. I ask. I try to ask for as many things as I possibly can. Yeah. yeah. Because you I don't mean, know. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, like, I definitely like. I think that I'm a talented person. I have a great creative partner. I work for a great organization. I had a lot of help, which is another thing I think that people should be open about. Like, I had like a person become invested in like my education and like well-being as far as like radio is concerned. I did a lot with those resources, I think, but um but also like I try to make sure that like cuz it's not like Paula, like I'm like you, it's not necessarily like my immediate nature to right. want to, you know, like be like, "Hey, give me this thing." So now I just try to like get the word out of my mouth before I get to the I have one thing that I did ask for now that I remember is like I asked for like months for an office here. Uh-huh. Like, fucking every day I just was just like and then at one point I even said, "I know I sound like a dick, but I really want that office." And then the person was like, "Yeah, you do kind of sound like a dick." And I was like, but "Wait, maybe that's good. Like, that's maybe you'll get your office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how you get your office." So I asked, and I fucking, I was so annoying, and I got it. And yeah. Yeah. Squeaky I, wheel, though. Yeah. squeaky wheel. I like, I love my office <laughs> so much. I just, I love it. So that is something I asked for. <laughs> what about you, Julie? I was just. Um, my, I, I'm not in a position where I'm at this point thinking like, oh, I need this at Radiotopia and that. So I don't feel like I'm asking a lot. But what I've just found is, A, you just ask. You just direct. You don't talk around it. You just go frank. And I have to say, give Carrie Hoffman a lot of credit. She's been a great boss. She's been really supportive. Uh, the few things I have asked for that you know haven't been able to work out, she tells me why. It's a, it's a teachable moment. Like Everything's better. But also, you can't be apologetic about asking. And I feel like that's something that for women is, you know, you often feel... I'm sorry to bring this up, but, or like you feel some sort of guilt for asking for something that you feel like you deserve. And that is something I just, you know, yeah. we all got to work on. I got to work on it. You all got to work on it. Um, and just, just remember, you have every right to ask. Sue said it earlier. You've just said it. It's like, there's so much. And also like, don't be shy. Um, you, I think it's our duty as people um, managing to be open to any inquiry that comes our way and responsive to any inquiry that comes our way. And I think that was like the third coast sort of way of being was very open and giving back and sharing and like kind of equalizing even though yes we're managers yes we're very approachable we should be and I find the surprise when I like write emails back to people and they're surprised to get an email back from me I think that's insane you're you're like a person you're a peer you're a woman peer perhaps so I would just say like you everyone in this room should just be treating it kind of everyone I mean there's something to be said for appreciating uh, con contributions we've made but I do feel like there's a sense that kind of hierarchy is imaginary in my mind at least so um, yeah just ask don't apologize and you know learn from from the answers that's a really good response though <laughs> yeah okay. that's a really good response yeah. it's really been on my chest um, <laughs> so something's been on my chest yeah um, so I think a lot of you guys saw that list that came out the other day with yeah. the 20 guys in it oh my who apparently are running podcasting behind all of our backs. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that list was like, yeah, what's that? Oh, yeah, no, I saw it. I saw the apology and I saw that whole thing. Um, the, in addition to the... That's how I feel. <laughs> um, in addition to that list being very, very like male heavy, it was also really white. And the panel that we have here today is also really white. So as people who are lady ballers in positions of power, what do you plan to do 
to make it so that people who are in positions like yours, um, so that it, like, the look is not so monochromatic? Uh, this is why I think it's so important to pay interns. It's like the number one reason. If you, yeah, if you have a, if you're running a company and you're like, oh, weird, our staff is all white. Uh, it's <laughs> very often because you're not paying your interns and your interns are like rich white Wesleyan kids um, or another college. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lots, <laughs> lots of potential colleges there. Um, if you have, you know, and it's like your interns are people who move up through the ranks. And so you have to start them in a place that they can afford. Um, so that's, I think that's like, for me, like the number one most important thing is to like, is, t I mean, and also you have to, you, like, you have to look for people and you, you have, have to, to look, you yeah. have to go yeah. out there. You have I to mean, cast a yeah, wider net beyond who you know already. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And especially like in public radio, like I was often working at jobs where we would get like 100 uh, applications, 99 of them from white people. Um, and I think that's also because of where you're posting jobs. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I think it's really important to post jobs in like black journalism associations. Um, there's, yeah, there are, and like Latino journalism associations, like you have to, you have to think about that stuff. But really I think so much of it is about the, the intern aspect of it. And um, yeah, and that like people who are super advantaged get these internships and they move up. Yeah, I mean, it has to be a central pillar of what you're, um, when you're recruiting, when you're thinking of, you know, when you're deciding what shows to make and what people to hire, and it's just, it, you know, who they are and, and having, a, having a diverse, it just has to be part of your DNA and part of the infrastructure, or it's just gonna be kind of like an afterthought, um, and that never works. You guys also all mentioned having like some sort of somebody who is like above you, like having a mentor of some sort. And I actually think that like when I think about like what's allowed me to enter podcasting and radio, and I think about even like in the 27,000 careers that I had before now, um, there was always like someone taking an interest in me was like a really pivotal thing and helping me be able to like move forward in environments where it seemed like that wasn't a likelihood. Um, what like what is it now, like what's you guys all mentioned having mentors what is it like now being in the position of somebody who has to like you know seek out people and kind of take them under the wing it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> i really enjoy connecting with people who you 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 sense that they it's like again in that desire and you realize yeah we all had probably people who helped us get where we are i'll never forget paul zalis from montana who hired me to produce a radio a live radio show mm -hmm. before I had any experience, and he really—he literally said to me, "All right, kid, I was much younger. Um, <laughs> here's your chance. Don't fuck it up." And I worked really hard on this thing aside my job, and you know, it, it was the, probably the thing that got me back into radio. I'd kind of strayed a bit, and so um, I—I I don't know if it's subconscious or consciously, but I hope I can be that for as many young women, especially, as possible, because it just that confidence, that kind of believing in someone, having faith in their ability. Uh, encouraging their ideas to take mm -hmm. chances it's it's crucial yeah I would never I mean my whole I mean just I sort of came of age at the Wall Street Journal and mm -hmm. it's a very very um, editing heavy place and so I spent countless hours you know being forced to sit next to my editor looking at my story rewriting it rewriting it rewriting it and um, you know, there was never a, we never emailed each other. It just, it, the, the amount of time that people took in making my work great and teaching me how to be a writer, um, uh, that it, in my perfect world, like that's, that's the way it should work where, where I'm, we get to sit and spend time together making something better, um, and learning how to do it. I, I feel like, as someone mentioned earlier, like Google Docs has been kind of like the death of like mentoring and training because it's just like easy. And, I, and I'm guilty of it. I mean, we, you know, we're all so rushed all the time, but um, there's a big difference between sitting down together and listening to something or looking at something on the screen and then um, and just doing it in comments in a Google Doc. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's just like 
I, I always have to remind myself because I'm always in such a rush and I'm always doing so many different things that like if I just actually took the time to sit for half an hour with this person, we could hash it out together and they would come out, they would have learned so much in that half an hour that they never would have like in an email. So are we going to? Um, I think it was Ann Friedman, the uh, writer and co-host of the wonderful podcast, Call Your Girlfriend. Um, she said once that like, there's no real point in like kind of kissing ass of people above you. Um, you should be like kissing the asses and like helping people who are like on your level and below you because those are the people that you're going to work with and those are the people who are probably going to be your boss someday. <laughs> um, and also, yeah. so that's like one reason. <laughs> yeah. But but it's also, I think it's just like really important to just kind of like know who's out there. I mean, almost everyone I've ever hired for a job, they're people that I've either met in radio clubs or they're people who've emailed me to be like, hey, I'm interested in getting into podcasting. Can you tell me about it? And then we've talked and I thought they're really cool and they've gone and like learned how to edit audio and then have come and like work with me. So um, I always try to, to like, I mean, if people email me, sometimes I'll take like a month or six weeks to write back because I'm pretty busy right now. And I'm also like, my wife is in labor starting this, like starting like two hours ago. So I <laughs> No, no, it's okay. She's That's fine. She's fine. She's the like, lead. she's yeah. like walking around. Um, she's, she's like, everything's fine. She's good. She's, no, no, no. Oh my God. She doesn't, she doesn't Wait, need I, you right I, now. I, I sound you. like the worst spouse ever. But, um. But you're trying to mentor all these people. <laughs> no, I gotta be here for you guys. <laughs> no, no, she's, it's going to be like at least like 30 hours, they said. So it's yeah. fine. It's fine. She's I, just like <laughs> chilling and watching movies, napping. It's cool. Um, <laughs> my point was that it might take me longer to write back to you <laughs> than usual. But, uh, but yeah, I always really like to talk to people about like this business and getting into it and <laughs> how to get into it. So um, you, any of you guys should like email me if you ever want to talk about the bits. <laughs> Like wait like two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's it's in my pocket. It's, it's I know on, it's fine. Do you guys cool. ever have you guys ever introduced somebody as like your mentee? Like yeah. oh this is what? I have several. Isn't that yes, kind of embarrassing. So you introduced them then? I've had it because I, I was in a room a... yesterday and some guy was yeah. like oh this is my my I'm I'm his mentor this is my mentee. Yeah that's weird. Well, depends, I've like, never... it depends like age of difference. My mentee wait. is twenty. She is like a junior in college. Okay. So like oh, okay. we met her when she was like a junior in okay. high school. So was it's it different. literal? Like were they matched um, for the conference maybe? No, 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 no. Okay. Like, it would be like, oh, this is my wife, Jenna. I'd be like, this is my mentee. <laughs> That's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> That's weird. I thought it's it was weird. weird. Yeah. Uh, well, really we are weird. actually, we are totally out of time. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, can, um, can I say one just, um, I would love to tell the whole room. I've had, just, with my experience in Third Coast and now this, which has been awesome. Thank you, WNYC and everyone for all the work. Um, <laughs> The community is so, so important. Every time you cross paths with someone, you are growing a relationship with them. Every time you join a, a, the, an email thread, every time you go to a local listening group, I know there's a huge one here. I'm just saying take every opportunity to get into the mix. If it, from, you can go from unknown to commenting on the air list and people start knowing who your name is. Mm -hmm. it, just, it, it just builds up over time. It accumulates and you cross. I met Chiquita. Are you in the, she may not be in the room. So Chiquita is now working with PRX, and she was like, yeah, we met at a PRPD party um, at 3 in the morning in the PRX suite about, like, six years ago. <laughs> oh my God. And she said you... She oh, said, there she is. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I just, like, I had... All of a sudden, I remembered that moment, and you know, and I remember thinking, like, damn, she's going places, you know. So, and, and here we all are. So, I'm just saying, like, every interaction, every opportunity counts, and and and, and they will come back to kind of just reward you, and you and it, and you meet great. You know, there are other reasons to do it. It's not just to get ahead, but um, yeah, it's so important to just put yourself in the mix at every possible opportunity. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that is actually no. That's a good. Put yourself in the mix. If you have any takeaway from this, put yourself in the mix and always ask for more money. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Oh, good job. Good job.